This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 722, recorded on Wednesday, May 22nd, 2019. What can we learn from history? Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your head with cranky crows, fire, and help from mom. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Everything looks a bit grim at the moment. If you happen to be living on planet Earth, that is rising CO2, record high temperatures, massive winter storms, failing ice sheets and melting glaciers, sea levels creeping higher, seasonal patterns shifting, leaving living creatures in the lurch, species disappearing now at mass extinction rates, and the political will to do something about it is still struggling to find politicians who comprehend the scale of the trouble we are in. Yes, it's all looking pretty grim. But thankfully, there is a solution. And that solution is 100% available to us right now in something called the future. It turns out all the things that cause the problems we face today are things that were created in the past. We didn't make this mess. People who came before us made this their future. So if in our future we do things differently than they did them in the past, the problems we now face will also be in the past. It's that simple. Not only that, but in the future, we can do things so differently that they have been done in the past. And we can actually live in a world that goes beyond solving the next immediate crisis and live in a world where we are making active improvements to our standard of living and the health of our ecosystem. And all it will take to get there is moving into a future of our own making. And another episode of This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. to you kiki and blair and a good science to you too justin blair and everyone out there welcome to another episode of this week in science we are back again to talk about science because that's what we do here and we're so glad that you're joining us for this episode so let's jump into this wonderful show i have stories about cranky corvids civil war cures and coloring history what do you have, Justin? I've got uh, a fire in the kitchen of early humans, a chlorofluorocarbon whodunit, and praying for rain. We, we don't need to pray. It's been raining this last week. Anyhow, mm -hmm. Blair, what's in the animal corner? I have some helpful primate mothers. I have some lazy sharks and some ancient bed bugs ancient bed bug no kind of bed bug is a good bed bug is no bed bugs mm -hmm. i don't know uh, no, but now to each his own i suppose yeah. nobody likes a bed bug but let's not bug you about it i want to tell you that if you have not yet subscribed to this week in science you can do so at twist.org, or you can find us on YouTube. Uh, additionally, we are just about anywhere you find good podcasts these days. So let's jump into the science. Who wants to do a little bit of Civil War history with me? Eh. Yeah. Uh, all right. <laughs> I yeah. feel like this is going to be a slideshow. It's not so much Civil War history. We're not doing reenactments. Nobody's going to be out there in in the Civil War the Civil War uniforms. We're, we're not doing any of that right now. This I want is to be a fork. This is all about science. We're talking about the science of the Civil War. And apparently during the Civil War, there were a bunch of medicines in use that uh, 
nobody has really looked into, but battlefield surgeons use them to fight infections. Nobody, it was just the beginning of the idea of germ theory at that time. And so nobody had identified really these different bacteria that were responsible or what was causing gangrene or what was causing an infection that couldn't be gotten rid of. They did tons of amputations, but and, and there were all these wounds that had to be cared for and healed. And this is this is uh, this is the the war that uh, killed more uh, American people than in anything else when we fought. And probably are one mm -hmm. of our least efficient wars that we've engaged <laughs> in, too, in terms of our ability to actually, uh, you know, inflict uh, mass trauma. So, yeah, the, the deaths would likely be attributed to. Uh, what would today be a completely survivable injury because of lack of antibiotics and that sort of thing? Yeah. Right. And so there was, uh, there were these physicians in the Confederacy that they started using uh, preparations of native medicinal plants to cure things, to help things. And people wrote down what they did. In 1863, a botanist named Francis Porcher compiled a book of medicinal plants native to the southern U.S. And these plants were also used in Native American traditional medicine. And for a study that was just published in Scientific Reports, they went through Porcher's books and then they got samples of a few species that had been indicated in the study, uh, in his studies and his uses on the battlefield um, to try and see how they stood up against bacteria of today. They used these three species, uh, Lyrodendron tulipifera and Aralia spinosa, spinosa and Quercus albus. So there was an oak species in there. Um, they also, uh, they, let's see, what were the other ones? They had, a, they had an, a species of oak in there and a, a couple of others. I don't know the, uh, the common names. Here we go. Tulip poplar and devil's walking stick was the third. And that's a thorny, woody shrub, the devil's walking stick, which kind of makes sense with the common name. These plants were, were gathered and they used extracts exactly as Porcher had specified in his, in his notes on the battlefield. And then they tested them on three species of multi-drug resistant bacteria. And this is not just regular bacteria, yeah. no, multi-drug no, stuff. Multi-drug resistant. These guys, we had, we they fight off a, a, a lot of our antibi antibiotics that we use today. So, the, one of the bacteria, I, I, I can't even say this, Acino, Acinotobacter baumannii, better known as Iraqibacter, <laughs> <laughs> because it's associated with vets who returned from the Iraq war and had a lot of wounds that were hard to heal. Uh, and it is resistant to most first-line antibiotics. Staphylococcus aureus, we're very con we're, we're, we know very well from staph infections, these skin infections that can also lead to systemic bloodstream infections. And they also looked at Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is a leading cause of hospital infections today and can cause life-threatening pneumonia and septic shock. So these are bad guys in the bacterial world when we're talking about medicine. They tested white oak and tulip poplar, and it found that it inhibited the growth, growth of Staphylococcus aureus. The white oak extracts inhibited the growth of the baumannii and the, the pneumoniae. And the extracts from both of the plants also inhibited staph from being able to form biofilms. And that's really important because when bacteria can kind of talk to each other through their quorum sensing, mm -hmm. they can group together and create a stronger, a stronger system, a stronger population that is even more resistant to our methods Novel of- compounds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So of, yeah. these biofilms are, are bad news in infections. And so they found that these natural medicinal compounds were really effective against these bacteria in the lab. And this is one of the first tests that's been done on these kinds of traditional plant remedies that have had, you know, notes taken on them that have, that have just been sitting on a shelf 
for some odd years. Although many people do use natural medicinal compounds, these kinds of studies have not been done to show exactly how they're effective or what they do to have their effects. And so this is hopefully the first in a long line of studies that will tell us a lot more about the plants that are around us and what they can do to keep us healthier and maybe yeah, find and, and new antibiotics. Is, yeah, and this is the source of so many of our antibiotics anyways from the natural world. It's the, the synthetic aspect, the pharmaceutical aspect is then in the mass production, uh, mm -hmm. manufacturing mm -hmm. of compounds to, to, to deploy. Uh, well, yeah, they're usually derived from uh, the natural world. Right. And we talk a lot about, oh, going to the Amazonian jungles or going, yeah. you know, going to the rainforest and finding these native plants and these, you think, this is in the southern U.S., <laughs> yeah, that's great. It's right in our backyard. Right huh? in our backyard. And these are things that have been used by people for a very long time. So, yeah. So like you like you mentioned, just nobody uses that voice when when discussing going to Arkansas and Alabama and Georgia. Nobody I mean, nobody talks like that about visiting the South. Maybe they will soon. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, the, you know, the, the interesting thing is maybe there we can isolate the compounds within these natural extracts to find out what are the active compounds then those can go down those pharmaceutical routes that you mentioned justin yeah. and yeah see where it takes us but i thought this looking at civil war history to, and civil war medicine to give us new approaches to fighting bacterial infections i thought it was a really interesting uh interesting view yeah and it is a little bit of a meta study in a way uh, mm -hmm. in that the the Civil War uh, cures that they found were actually Native American cures, yeah. which have probably persisted mm -hmm. on the plains for, you know, 10,000 years. Longer. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Moving on, though, moving on to more history, looking at dead things. Let's not keep Ooh. things alive. What do we do when they're already dead and you want to find out more about them? Well, when we're looking at fossils that have been preserved. Oh, very dead. Yeah, when we're looking at things in rocks, very often there's not much left of them to know what they looked like. And so when we're talking about what dinosaurs actually looked like, did they have feathers and what color were those feathers? Did they have scales? What color were those scales? What about little mammals, little rodents from ages ago? What color was their fur? How did they actually look? Well, it's hard to know because we haven't really we we know a, we know a lot about color chemistry, but it's come a long way in the last several years of really understanding which compounds are involved in creating the molecular structure of certain either light absorbing or reflecting compounds that give fur and scales and feathers their colors. And in in mammal fur the fur comes in basically brown or black or reddish yellow. And those yep, are produced yep. by two types of pigment from, mel from melanin. Eumelanin leads to the black or brown and pheomelanin leads to the reds and the yellows. Pheomelanin, though, likes to break down. It's not as sturdy as eumelanin. And so researchers have been able to Get an idea more so of the black and brown fur of ancient fossils, but not so much which ones might have been colored differently. So paleontologists have been studying how pigments look in modern animals. And a researcher at University of Manchester, Joy Wogelius, Roy Wogelius and his colleagues, they ended up seeing that chemical compounds with rings of sulfur, with sulfur in them, are actually a marker for eomelanin in animals that have recently died. So those sulfur rings break down over time as the animal decayed, and they found that there was a relationship, however, between sulfur and zinc. And so zinc, they are starting to use as this tag. It's kind of a proxy of the sulfur in the rings 
that used to be there, but is now broken down. So uh, the, the metal remains in these little tiny fibers, and the researchers are now using X-ray synchrotron fluorescence imaging from Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. I mean, why not? Why not? Let's just take high-powered X-rays and shoot them at an old fossil to see what we can see. The researchers found patterns of metal traces with the metals in the fossilized bits of hair from from an old old dead mouse, and uh, the high concentrations really were all over the body of this mouse, everywhere except its underbelly, which they think was colored white. And so now using these this X-ray synchrotron fluorescence imaging, they've been able to kind of figure out what an old mouse might have looked like long ago. Hmm. Yeah. Brown. They, brown. <laughs> Reddish, like not brown. To you, Blair, it would look brown. <laughs> but Yeah, same difference. <laughs> But in fact, because of this zinc and sulfur that's left over that they're able to able to see using these x-rays, they know that the fur on this long dead animal had these compounds that probably made it a nice reddish color. Reddish. Not so brown. Reddish. Rust colored. Rust colored. Yeah. It, I mean, maybe it looked like a nice red ferret. I don't know. Little red fox. So, so the little red to fox tell mouse. Me ferrets are red. <laughs> oh no! No! Oh no! <laughs> oh, Smashing no. more. Let's synth not color. Yeah, assignment. let's not get in a color From conversation. Color <laughs> um, so yeah, the first thing, of course, that occurs then is: does that mean the platform, or uh, the uh, plant life, or the uh, the 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 dirt uh, around? these rodents was of a similar color was this was this a camouflage or was this um you know you might be then able to infer something about the terrain that this lived in yeah one of the things uh that some researchers think uh just based on modern animals and um, you know the coloration of modern animals that actually the red is something that would allow them to blend in you might not think of it, but in uh, the greenish underbrush, that the red reddish color actually, because it's a that that contrasting color actually allows them to blend in, blend in and hide more effectively. And so for, a little for, a little mouse in the blind. under, yeah. yeah. But that's based on color, uh, somewhat colorblind predators. Which then may, uh, this is in we're extrapolating, means that the uh, dinosaurs might have been slightly colorblind. Huh. <laughs> or not dinosaurs, but maybe larger mammalian predators were colorblind. Yeah, but it it, it does. Uh, yeah, this is only three million years old, right? Uh, but uh, but it does give it does give clues to a lot of other things. Um, it's really interesting. Oh my gosh. I, I like no, but and on this one, the uh, the reality of. You know, it, as in the last study, it was looking at these old documents from the Civil War to give us insight into something modern. What we've done is researchers have looked at modern animals to see how things look in them today to be able to give us a hint of how things might have looked long ago in the past. And so these two different takes on how to do the science gives us a lot of insight into the present and the past. Nice. Yeah. Tell me a story, Justin. What you got? Uh, a mystery of sorts that has been rooting around in the scientific cellar for many years. It has to do with humans and starches uh, in the human diet. We humans have extra genes that allow us to better utilize starches than our genetic cousins in the ape world. But where did they come from? Well, at first we had assumed that this was an adaptation that we took on once we started farming. So we have this easy access to plants and tubers created for uh, a selection for better digestion. And that's how this arised. But then we got a little bit better at understanding how to trace backwards 
the evolution of genes and farming seemed much too recent of an event. Uh, the, the genes for this extra starch uh, digestive gene seem to trace back even much further than the 14,000-ish uh, year history of farming. So now a discovery in the Classies uh, River Cave in South Africa's Southern Cape. Charred food remains from uh, hearths, little uh, cooking places, are providing the first archaeological evidence that somewhat current humans were roasting and eating plant starches as early as 120,000 years ago. That's uh, uh, 110,000 years before there was any evidence of farming in Africa. So the new research by an international team of archaeologists published in the Journal of Human Evolution provides archaeological evidence that has previously been lacking to support the hypothesis that the duplication of the starch digestion genes is indeed an adaptive response to increased starch diet, and it's now matching up much better with the time frame of how we had traced the gene backwards. This is very exciting, uh, quotey voice of lead author Cynthia Larbe, Department of Archaeology at the University of Cambridge, uh, which is good. You should always be excited about your work. The genetic and biological <laughs> evidence previously suggested that early humans would have been eating starches. Our results showed that these small ashy hearths were used for cooking food and starchy roots and tubers were clearly part of their diet from the earliest levels at around 120,000 years ago, which is as far back as this cave goes, uh, through 65,000 years ago, which is as recent as this cave looks to have been habitat, uh, uh, inhabited. Despite changes in hunting strategies and stone tool technologies, the evolution that was taking place alongside this, they were still cooking roots and tubers. Uh, Professor Sarah Wurz of the University of uh, the School of Geography, Archaeology, and Environmental Studies at the University of Witzwatersand, Johannesburg, South Africa, principal investigator of the site, says the research shows early humans being uh, beings followed a balanced diet and that they were ecological geniuses able to exploit their environments intelligently for suitable foods and perhaps even medicines. So this is this uh, it's a small group of people that were inhabiting this area. They were cooking roots and uh, plants, and they also had proteins and fats from shellfish, fish, small and large fauna. So they had, they were go they were eating everything. Basically, humans were just eating everything in this uh, community. Fish so and chips uh, sounds starch, delicious. Yeah, yeah. Starch isn't something that happens when we started farming, but rather is as old as humans themselves, because this is sort of considered one of the earliest current human. Uh, morphologies as it is almost indistinguishable. It's something uh, there's supposedly a little bit more hardy than a, than a modern human, uh, but what wasn't? <laughs> really, if you look back, uh, yeah. like what was, right? Uh, but what's also sort of a side thingy that was sort of interesting to me about this story was, was uh, that it, this is 120,000 years ago and humans are using fire to cook with. Okay, so earliest example, at least, of cooking starches. However, uh, Neanderthals had fire, and they're in Europe. They're really far away. The so I had to kind of look into this because I'm like, I started to think like, when did fire? Because we think we invented fire, right? That's one. Of, that's one of our earliest technological uh, things that we invented was fire. And uh, Homo erectus apparently had fire. Perhaps back as much as a million years ago. Was well, that was still fire. us. It was just like, well, we... <laughs> but maybe. And also, maybe not. So it's entirely possible uh, that fire was developed by a non direct ancestor of modern hominid or modern humans. Possible. And that it was but adapted. Was, yeah, yeah, but was fire initially used for cooking? What, what, so, how did, so how did, how question. did that all get going, right? So we de so that's very hard to find mm -hmm. the evidence of cooking. What we do have the evidence of in Neanderthal and in Homo erectus is the use of fire. Uh, li likely we could say it's for light and warmth. Th those are just things mm -hmm. that fire does. Uh, but we also have evidence of hardening of tools and uh, a, a making a malleable uh, silicate rock 
so that it can be transformed into a tool. So we have manufacturing of tool use uh, far preceding uh, the current modern human existence uh, on the planet already. And so logically, uh, food would be another thing. And Neanderthals, it looks like, had these sort of heart spaces that would make food and that sort of thing as well. So, uh, But one of those things that we attribute to our evolution technologically, the invention of fire, is something we inherited, not something we invented. Thanks, Grandpa. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you Ancient for fire. Humans. They were so forward-looking. Oh, our, our, we're always looking for the future. Looking ahead. Yes. You know what's coming up next, though? I think uh, it's oh. time for Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair! She loves all creatures, cried at small. Five pet, little pet, no pet at all. Want to hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. Cat Blair. Uh, now let me ask both of you: Have you ever considered bringing your mother along on a date? No. No. <laughs> no. No. Never. Never thought of. Well, not, not if one. you were a bonobo, not, it it be. might be advantageous. Um, this is a study from Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. Uh, looking specifically at the influence of mothers on the number of grandchildren they get, specifically in the mating fitness, uh, the, the mating success, the male fitness of their sons. So they observed wild populations of bonobos in the Democratic Republic of Congo and wild populations of chimps in Ivory Coast, Tanzania, and Uganda. They found that both bonobo and chimpanzee mothers would advocate for their sons in male-on-male -male conflicts. That was universal. However, bonobo mothers went even further to aid their son's copulation efforts. How did oh, they do that? Oh, it dear. wasn't talking up the ladies <laughs> on everything they're most known for and, oh, you must go out with my son. Oh, no. Instead, they were protecting their son's mating attempts from other males. They were running interference and they were intervening in other males' mating attempts after their son had mated with an individual. So they were trying to monopolize that female for their son trying to kind of knock out the other competition the bonobo mothers also were able to use their rank in the bonobos matriarchal society to give their sons access to popular spots within the social groups which gave them higher male status which gave them better mating opportunities these specific interactions were rare in chimpanzee societies and did not have an effect on male fertility, most likely because chimpanzees uh, are a patriarchal society. The males generally are more dominant over females in their social groupings, so the actions of chimp mothers would be overall less influential than those of the bonobo mothers. Um, but when they started to kind of identify exactly what was going on there, it's not just that bonobo mothers did everything for all of their babies. They did not extend similar help to their daughters. Usually in bonobo social systems, the daughters disperse from their, their community and the sons stay. But even when the daughters stayed in the community, they, the bonobo mothers didn't help them. So really, they're trying to focus on the males and their mating success. So the, the current kind of hypothesis of why this is happening is that it somehow allows for indirect continuation of genes, which if that's why, I don't know why they wouldn't help the females unless maybe the females have the potential of being competition for them. I, I the, think that's if the, if the daughter is staying in the same troop, then yes, the daughter is in direct competition with the mother. Yeah. Um, so that has to be why. Yeah. Uh, additionally, but, if you think about the difference in output, uh, yeah. the female yeah. only ha it goes into only has an egg available every so often, not all the time uh -huh. ready. 
and males are always ready. So there's yeah, also sperm's the... a dime a dozen. I've said it once. <laughs> I'll say it a thousand times. <laughs> sperm is a dime a dozen. <laughs> so so it's actually you get a lot more than a dozen. Uh, so That's the good. the thing is. Uh, the, the thing that occurred to me a is dozen, a dozen, I don't weird. know, I, cubic, cubic measurements of some sort. Anyway, go ahead. I, I, uh, I, I like both of those uh, hypotheses. The thing that sort of uh, I, that occurred to me, though, first for a female dominated society is that there must be an assumption, and it may be true, the males are just poorly equipped intelligently. It might not be true. It might not <laughs> actually be true, but they might be like, <laughs> Oh, there's no, it's, he's like, I have a boy. He's not going to figure this out. Oh, I'm going no. to have to help, you know, it's, like, going, to, it's, it's it, going to be the mom from, uh, oh, what, uh, what's the movie with, oh, okay. I'll, it'll come to me in a minute. I'll find it. I was thinking it's kind of a, a Lisa versus Bart Simpson thing. If that's what you're <laughs> talking about. Right. No, so from better off they're... dead from better off dead. <sighs> and there's, there's the overbearing mom with the son who she drags around and she's oh you you've met my boy and she's trying to hook him up with the french exchange student and come over for dinner and we'll have french food and french bread you love my boy french, french the language of love you know and she's really overbearing Mm -hmm. like that. That's absolutely, yeah, what's happening here. <laughs> They're, they are just trying to make sure that their genes are well taken care of. Um, the, the, one of the more, you know, sciencey ways of saying that, that the, one of the lead authors says is that these females have found a way to increase reproductive success without having more offspring themselves. So the idea here is that they can, um, make sure that there is a good number of 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 uh, grandchildren out there because they are past mating age that is possible so they're just trying to really ensure return on investment in that son so there you go the nobo families <laughs> sure i am glad i made a good investment in this boy this boy is such a good investment okay sorry yeah. next story and <laughs> and speaking of good investments Speaking of good investments, tiger sharks know one when they see one. Um, this is a study from Murdoch University's Harry Butler Institute and the Australian Institute of Marine Science. They attached special tags with combined uh, cameras and motion and environmental sensors to 27 tiger sharks in the Ningaloo Reef off the coast of Western Australia. Now, tiger sharks have very sharp very large teeth. Uh, generally speaking, if you're thinking about the three most dangerous shark species to humans, that is the great white shark, the tiger shark, and the bull shark. That being said, as we've talked about on this show many, 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 many times, not many people actually die from shark attack each year. So those are the quote unquote most dangerous, but still that's that's 10 deaths a year spread across three whole species of sharks all over the planet. So it's Anyway, regardless, tiger sharks are known to be um, very good hunters, very aggressive, very sharp pointy teeth, very good. Um, and so looking at exactly how they behave in Ningaloo Reef gives an opportunity to see how their kind of interactions are with their natural prey out in the ocean. And so they collected, so far, it's, it's a pretty small selection. It's only about 60 hours of footage, but it's definitely a start. They actually were looking at 3D movements of the sharks in relation to their prey, which I think is what made this study so particularly interesting. So they saw a number of target species. The big ones were turtles, large fish, and other sharks. Those are the three main uh, prey species that they were looking at through this study. Uh, now turtles, that's one of the ways that you can tell that a tiger shark has really sharp teeth with really strong bite muscles as they can actually bite into and predate upon sea turtles, which means they have to get through that shell. So um, that is a pretty good hunter. Um, and then large fish and other sharks, which are one could argue is also a large fish. Um, so those are the main prey species. What they found, was that the tiger sharks are surprisingly lazy predators. So in their 
3D sensors. When they saw a target species, the turtle, the large fish, other sharks, when they saw them performing escape maneuvers, when a tiger shark first showed interest, the sharks would just continue on their course. They wouldn't even try to chase them. Once the individual was alerted and was right in front of them, they, mm, not worth it. Not worth it at all. So they don't waste energy stalking prey that are already aware of them and can easily escape. So they draw that as a comparison to lions in the African savanna. They do kind of the same thing. They sneak up on their food or they leave it be. So they say that this is the shark's way of minimizing energy output and chances of success by sneaking up on unsuspecting turtles or large fish. So from this information... Aside from knowing how tiger sharks act in general, they hope to understand how tiger sharks in a reef alter the behaviors of prey around them. And if you think about uh, a good kind of correlative th to this, there's the wolves in Yellowstone, right? So when you remove the wolves, the deer, they get totally complacent. There's no predators. There's just chomp, 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 chomping on all of the different plants. They're not being scared away from those areas. And they're eating these plants to the point of killing them all over the place, completely changing the, the landscape. When you reintroduce the wolves, it's not just that that controls the deer population. It's that it keeps the deer on their toes or hooves, if you will. And so they can't sit and chow down. So yeah, it, also, it also sharks, puts them out. It puts them out into the. Oh, sorry. It puts them out into the in the clearings and the open areas and the fields more, uh, so they have better visibility of what's around them. They stay out of the heavily uh, uh, foliaged areas, and so they do less impact. and And then they also start to bring plants through poop and to fertilize the open areas. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So now you could ask if we know this about tiger sharks the way that they behave, that they sneak up on the animals or they don't go after them at all. The more we understand that, the better we can understand how their prey items respond to the presence of tiger sharks. And when there are things like shark culls or shark finning going on that are greatly reducing the number of sharks on the planet, how will that impact the reefs? It's a very interesting question. Um, how, so how, how, how does sharks being lazy impact the reefs <laughs> how does it it's yeah. so if you know that if a if a turtle sees a tiger shark yeah. and the tiger shark sees the turtle that the tiger shark's not going to hunt the turtle turtle right. don't care turtle continues doing what it's doing but if there are sharks around and they know the only way they're going to get eaten is by being snuck up on that's going to affect turtle behavior maybe they're going in those proverbial clearings maybe they're scouting out territories before they eat so when you remove those then that can change their behavior as well mm -hmm. yep. yep pretty interesting it's an ecosystem people right a system it's an eco system that's right everybody has a place even the tiger sharks even those lazy tiger sharks <laughs> no they're know, just they're honest, just efficient to, they're smart and efficient and why waste yeah. the energy on somebody who's probably yeah. gonna get away i mean come on darn tootin yeah yeah i'm just not gonna go for it it's just being <sighs> smart predator smart predators all around all right everyone thank you for joining us it's time for us to take a quick break we are going to Take a break and come back in just a few minutes. Or we've got prayers for prayers for rain. We've got bouncing robots, coffee and your intestines. Oh, oh yes, all that and more in the second half of the show. So do please stay tuned for a little bit more this week in science. <laughs> Explain the things you've heard with more than intuition. A line of reason shows the way to go. A new conclusion. The methods are hypothesis, and patience are the only things I need. Put on 
a pair of goggles and go looking for the things I couldn't see. Thank you for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. I appreciate that you have taken some of your day, some of your time to think about science with us. If you want to think about science with us in person and you are in the Santa Fe, New Mexico area on the weekend of June 15th and 16th, we are doing a live podcast at the Interplanetary Festival. You can find information at interplanetaryfest.org about their festival, but we will be live from 4.15 p.m. to 5.45 p.m. in New Mexico time, which I think is mountain time. (laughs) But that's the Saturday, June 15th. We will be at the Interplanetary Festival podcasting live, and we're going to try and do a live stream. So if you're online and not there, maybe you can hang out with us there virtually. If you want to help support This Week in Science, you can head on over to twist.org. Twist.org is where you will find all sorts of links and ways that you can support Twist. We have the subscribe button. The subscribe button. Here, hold on one second. This is going to be a... Just just give me a... Okay, this is going to be great. Okay. Head over to twist.org where you can find all sorts of links to support or get involved with Twist. Like, how can you get involved? Well, subscribing is a great way to become a part of our audience. Click on the subscribe button and you'll find links to the big three, Google, YouTube, and Apple stores where you can subscribe to our podcast. Makes it nice and easy for you. The writing's really small and I can't see what I'm clicking on. (laughs) Nope, I should have queued this up ahead of time and I didn't. I'm sorry, everybody. Anyhow. You will also find a link to our Zazzle store. The Zazzle store is full of wonderful products with the Twist logo and also images from previous Blair's Animal Corner calendars. You can find gifts for yourself or other friends of yours who are Twist fans and a portion of the proceeds goes to support This Week in Science. We also have a link to our Patreon account and Patreon is the crowdfunding site that we use to be able to raise money to support what we do. It's as if you would become a patron of our podcasting art. So if you want to help out Twist, click on that Patreon link and become a patron of Twist. You know, everyone out there, thank you for supporting us if you already do support us. Thank you for listening to us if you already listen to us. All of this supports us and we really could not do what we do if it weren't for you. Thank you for your support. We can explain things you've heard with more than intuition. A lot of reasons shows the way to go new conclusion the methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need put on a pair of goggles and go looking for the things I couldn't see the answers lie somewhere within this scatter plot dot And we're back to This Week in Science. 
Yes, we are. And oh, as we come back from the break, as we always do, it is time once again for one of our favorite segments of the show. This weekend, what has science done for me lately? Lately. (laughs) Just taking it up there. Take it up there. That's right. All right. Well, this week's letter is not a letter so much as a song that I'm not going to sing because I'm I, I cannot do it justice and there's also copyright issues but oh, no. Emma Moulton Emma Moulton thank you for writing us a song called Hypothetical Science Study which should be sung to the tune of Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen What? Yes. <laughs> Uh, Is this the real life? Is this just theology? How does the brain work? Are we neurons and electricity? Look through the lens. Put on your lab coat and see. Where is planet nine? Is Pluto one of us? Life is tricky. Come easy go. Very large and micro. Everywhere humans go. So does all our knowledge. (laughs) Knowledge. (laughs) Gamma just killed a cat, killed a cell, a tumor in the head, blast radiation, now it's dead. Gamma, life had just begun, but now you've gone and thrown it all away. Science, oh, 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 didn't mean to make you cry when I said you wouldn't get all of your funding. Study on, study on, because it really matters. Too soon, my time has come. No asteroids today. It's all climate change. Goodbye, everybody. I've got to go. Maybe get my DNA before I'm extinct. Science. Ooh, 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 where the carbon goes, I don't want to rise because that will cause ocean acidification and then a guitar solo. I see a human hybrid offspring. Name's Denny, name's Denny. Mum was a Neanderthal. (laughs) First ancient human hybrid. Very, very exciting. Quantum level, quantum level, quantum level, quantum level, quantum level string theory. Oh, 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 oh. (laughs) I'm just a panda, large and cuddly. I eat bamboo with a sore stomach. Spare me this life from my evolution. Species come, species go. Let the mammoth go. Justin will not let you go. Let it go. Justin will not let you go. Let it go. Justin will not let you go. Let it go. Will not let you go. Let it go. Never, never let it go. Let it go. Never let it go. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, coral reefs. Oh, coral reefs. Coral reefs. Let me go. CRISPR Cas9 has edited a gene for me. For me. For me. For me. Now there's another guitar, guitar solo. solo. <laughs> <laughs> so you think you can help me find planet nine? Why am I still conscious with only half a brain? Oh, science. I've got so many questions. Just got so many. Just got so many questions. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Science really matters. Anyone can see. Science really matters. Science really matters. For me. Me. Oh my gosh, that is amazing. (laughs) Science rock opera. Well done, Gigi, too. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Science rock opera. Emma Moulton, thank you for those epic lyrics. Not worthy. No. Yeah. You just Mm. raised the bar. Wow. Raise the bar on what has science done for me lately. It, it, it brought me this, these lyrics to this song, and I will never hear Bohemian Rhapsody the, the same again. That's great. <laughs> let the mammoth go. Justin will not let it go. Let it go. I will not let it go. <laughs> let it go. I will, I will not let, let it go. Yes. Let it go. Yeah, so at some point, the, maybe the three of us need to yeah, we could. Sing. Yes. We could sing. Yes, that is. A yeah, good thing. at a live show, that could be an added thing at a live show that we do. Oh my goodness! Yeah, That's Emma fun. recorded a, herself singing it, and I'm sorry I couldn't <gasps> play it. I can't play it because of the oh, no. the copyright the music issue. Yeah. 
Yes, the backing track. Uh, so. But can I have a copy of this? Because I need to hear this. <laughs> I, I need really, to make it available. That's really, yeah. uh, yep. need to hear yep. it. Mm -hmm. oh, on that, send us your What Has Science Done For You Lately? Did it stir a song in your heart? I don't know. Or you can just write us a note. All of these things. Send me an email, Kirsten, at thisweekinscience.com or put a note on our Facebook page, which is just This Week in Science on Facebook. Justin, tell me a story. Ah, yes. Uh, long before it was popular knowledge that global warming was a crisis, there was another crisis threatening the planet. Emissions of chlorofluorocarbons. We're putting... Oh, yeah, the ozone. Hole. Yeah, the ozone layer hole. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and that was going to allow a whole bunch of UV radiation to do bad things to things that were living on our planet. Uh, so people of yesterday fortuitously banned it, which is why we live in a future they created without worldwide UV radiation devastation. Uh, thank you, people of yesterday. Sorry you had to give up your hairspray and 80s hairdos, but uh, the longevity of the planet was, was worth it. Uh, we think. So despite the lack of big hair globally today, annual emissions of the banned chlorofluorocarbon have been increasing to the tune of 7,000 tons since 2013. Uh, hmm. This is according to research published in Nature by an international team of scientists from the UK, South Korea, Japan, USA, Australia, and Switzerland. The, I remember, noticed... Justin. I remember. I think we we reported on it and saying there's there's this, the CFCs, the ozone hole is getting bigger again. CFCs are going up and we don't know why. I think I remember so reporting on they, this. They set up monitoring stations across the planet. Uh, at first, very sort of remotely, mostly to sort of get the background uh, readings. And then they started to pop up these, these monitoring stations in more and more places. And the monitoring stations in Korea and, and Japan got the biggest hits out of anything. And so through triangulation of the monitoring stations that have been set up globally, it's been determined that somewhere in Eastern China is the main source of these chlorofluorocarbons. Uh, carbons. So they're maybe not surprising, uh, but something, uh, there is some manufacturing industry and it's really weird. Like the, the type, the uh, chlorofluorocarbon number 11, CFC number 11 that is being found was most commonly used to inflate foam. Uh, so this could be filling insulation for refrigeration or something like shipping packaging peanuts kind of a thing. Like the sort of thing that we have better alternatives for already. And, and it has another sort of layer to it, which is that these are things that eventually escape containment. Meaning the 7,000 tons that we've sort of recorded as having been increased could uh, actually be currently sequestered in different materials and will be reaching out over the next decades. Uh, so they haven't uh, specifically identified, probably because of some sort of you know, uh, international governmental protection for whatever, uh the exact industry or uh, businesses that are uh, doing this but it does look like china is violating an international melbourne treaty mm. that was uh, in instituted in actually not as far back as i would have assumed it's 2010. they're, they're yeah <laughs> and we're they, just and gonna do what at, we want looked, yeah, and they looked at the possibility that this was leaching from before treaty uh, materials that had already been created, and they say that would have been an insignificant amount in comparison to what they're registering. And the fact that it is so localized looks like CFCs are being utilized uh, in eastern China, which is the manufacturing center for China. So, yeah, uh, we need we need international law and regulation to combat mm. really big things like this, which then also is uh, a thing that we need to be paying attention to as our current uh, governmental body in the United States 
is itself staying out of a lot of international agreements to tackle big environmental issues. Uh, well, I feel like that's always the done. issue too, right? Is that, and we could end up in a political science podcast like that, trying to talk about this, but how do yeah. you, how do you enforce mm. this stuff? And I think that's, what's really problematic because especially if the United States is not adhering how do you punish the United States on a global scale? So I feel like right. that's part so, of this question is where is the accountability? Yeah. So, so there is, and I, and I can identify it slightly, or at least a portion of that without going into that whole uh, uh, sub tangent re ranty thing, which is that you would need to identify products uh, upon which this is being used to create. And if you can identify right. products, you can ban specific products until that change is made. If they're being used locally and that local nation is not adhering to treaty for its own, uh, if it's own product manufacturing, that's one thing. But if it's part of trade, then you can have an affect uh, mm -hmm. through, through, mm -hmm. through not allowing product. So there's more layers to this that need to be investigated. But they, a huge part of this has been now identified, at least source-wise, to a nation and to a region that is manufacturing. Right. And and this is also we were we were the hole was closing. It worked. Right. It was reversing the problem. It was to the point where this it would well, open up a little bit over the Antarctic uh, in the summer, I guess, for a little bit. But for the most part, it had been a problem a crisis, a situation that we had tackled and overcome. Uh, and yeah, so we just need to be a little more vigilant. And I think that's exactly your your previous point about how you pulled people, hold people accountable about this. I think that's why we had such great success when we tried to stop the CFCs before is that we identified specific products. And so yes. I think I think you're absolutely right. That is what has to happen. Is you have to figure out. Does so everyone have really big hair over there, or what exactly <laughs> is causing this in that area, and and crack down on that? You're absolutely right. And that, and that was too. That was too. Like hairspray was a thing that had CFCs. They're actually everything yeah. that had like spray bottles, right? Yeah, aerosols. Uh, but yeah. it was actually yeah the aerosols. But they were actually yeah. the minor component compared it's, to isn't the it refrigerant industrial sensitive. manufacturing. In, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was there it was a minor component of it, but it was the one that people recognized uh, most readily. And so when they started banning the even though it was a small percentage of it. So this is this sort of ties into the global warming thing about the thinking locally thing. Even those things that we're encouraging people to do that won't be the most impactful, uh, at least push that conversation forward to where I gave up my hairspray. Therefore, uh, you know, big refrigerant needs to come up with another solution or whatever the or big insulation needs to come up with another solution. Uh, as well. And so the minor sacrifices that we make on a daily basis uh, in order to, to, to make a difference in the world can make a difference in a little bit uh, less linear way than perhaps we think that they yeah. can affect. Yeah. Oh, hope we can nail it down now that we know where the source is and let's move yep. forward. Change it. Always fix it. Future. If you see where the problem is, you fix it. Oh, but you know, sometimes you have these different personalities, right? Between people. Some people just look at the situation like this ozone hole and this thing in China and they're like, oh, this is just bad, bad, it's bad. And then other people go, ooh, you think it's bad? I think it's bad too. You know, and other people are like, oh, it's, this is fine. We're going to be okay. It's, it's just great, you know? And then other people love that happy mood and they, yay, joy germs. Let's all share joy germs and be happy. But you know where that doesn't happen? Ravens. Huh? Ravens don't pick up on each other's positive outlooks, apparently. So I love smart birds. The ravens, the corvids, they're part of my my favorite group of birds. And now in a study that has recently been pu published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, researchers at the uh, University of Vienna and uh, colleagues wanted to figure out what aspects of empathy ravens might have, where they, what they pick up on. You know, we know we've talked on the show before about ravens 
mobbing and cawing together. And, you know, they get calling and they do things together. They're social birds and they also are quite intelligent. And so it, it, it wouldn't be surprising that they would have some aspect of empathy. And we've talked also about the the bird funerals and whether uh, birds mourn for the loss of other birds or uh, whether, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's also uh, evidence that if there's a person or an animal that's a bad actor and doing bad things, then the ravens pick up on that and share that information, and then all the ravens will be mean to and, and we, bad actors. And we've also learned that one of the ways that they sometimes deal with the dead is by dry we, helping them. There is Which that. Is, it's an awkward fact, but it's there. Awkward, but it's true. There. Yes. So uh, researchers trying to figure out how ravens might pick up on each other's moods decided that they would use a, uh, a system, a test that's called the cognitive bias test. And this has been used on a number of animals. And the way that the researcher describes it is, says, quote, it's basically how you would judge a glass if it's half full or half empty. Eight ravens were tested in pairs, and they were given a choice between a box with cheese, which is a really good treat to a raven, or one that had nothing, no treat. And then when the birds learned where the cheese was and where the no treat was, uh, they were given a new box in a spot that had never before been used in their training. And then the birds had to kind of figure out whether it was a trick or a treat. Is it going to be empty or is Mm -hmm. it going to have cheese? And so if the birds acted like, oh, this is going to have cheese in it and we're really excited to get in there, uh, then this is interpreted as optimism. You're going to have an optimistic bird. Or if the bird's just like, I'm not interested, I could care less, there's probably nothing in there. It's empty. That's considered pessimism, right? Being a pessimistic bird. Um, And then they tried a different test. One bird in a pair of birds was offered raw carrots, which the ravens are like, I don't like raw carrots. (laughs) Or they were offered dried dog food, which apparently is tasty Mm, and a nice yummy. That's great. Nom, nom, nom. And so again, we're we're looking at how the birds were acting. And the birds with the treat... They're like, oh, dog food. And they're moving their heads and they had a lot of body movements, very excited. The ones with the carrots spent time doing other things, avoiding the box, sometimes kicking and scratching in other places, acting cranky. And so one bird is looking in the box and seeing, acting this way. And the other bird in the pair, meanwhile, doesn't know what's in the box, just sees how its partner in this task is reactions. behaving. Yes, just the reactions. And so then the observer birds got the chance to uh, to check out the boxes themselves. And it turns out that the birds that had seen their partner being optimistic and excited didn't necessarily share that approach. But birds that saw their partners being pessimistic and negative we're more likely to be pessimistic and negative themselves. Hmm. So, anyway, uh, hmm. so in in ravens, it appears, according according to these results, that uh, the negative behaviors are more quote unquote contagious to other to, to other other ravens, um, and it may be you know this is a survival tactic that if there's you know, something good, it might not be good for you. And so maybe it's not always going to be a great thing. But if something's bad or if something's something you want to stay away from or not be interested in, then that is probably what you want to pay attention to. Yeah. If somebody smells the milk and goes, whoa, you're probably going to avoid it. Right. But Tonight. if they pour it in, like what they're drinking, <laughs> you still haven't decided if it's for you. That makes oh, perfect sense. That like translates perfectly to humans. Although I'm really, obviously, honestly, very confused by the people where you go, this smells terrible. Here, smell. And they do. And they ask you. (laughs) No, I take your word for it. Uh, I don't need to share 
in the suffering to have empathy for you, uh, nor am I that curious about something that awful. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, ravens apparently have some uh, degree of empathy for their other birds, or at least they're paying attention to their behaviors. This doesn't really answer the question of, in my mind, whether or not these birds have empathy for the feelings of other birds, but um, they're definitely paying attention and responding in kind. Yeah. Blair, no. Did you have a comment? No, you're happy. It yeah. makes sense. It all it all makes sense to me. I mean, it's if you think about it at the at the end of your day, there's this weird phenomenon where if one bad things ha thing happens to you, that's what you remember about your day. Yeah. But if a bunch of good stuff happens to you, you might just be in an overall good mood. But if they ask you how was your day, you're like, oh, it was good. It was fine. It was fine. And it's so normal. Mm -hmm. I mean, evolutionarily, we have a reason to focus on the bad or the scary or the upsetting because that's what you want to avoid right and so mm -hmm. I, I i it's not that surprising to me that that the the they're calling it pessimism pessimism but maybe just a reflection on the availability of resources yeah. might drive a crow or a raven to look somewhere else for food like oh you know what so, they keep so what striking out over there i'm gonna look somewhere else and in a lab situation when the birds are totally well fed and they're fine they're just like okay yeah and it's it's an uh it's a it's an important point because the the ravens have a diversity of diet mm -hmm. uh they have a diversity of things that they can go after and make food out of mm -hmm. so if something is a negative then just cross it off no point if the other mm -hmm. raven wouldn't Absolutely. eat it it's yeah. If they only like ate one thing, like if they only had one specific thing that they would eat, maybe it's, it's not the best bamboo, but or I mean, you know, whatever it is. But I might try it anyway. I might take a look at it because you know, yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah. You know what, Justin? You'd be really surprised, but right before we got to the end of my story, it started to rain. Oh. Oh, speaking of rain. There you go. <laughs> transition, transition, transition. So, okay, there are many things that people believe. Right or wrong, people are walking, thinking belief machines. They they have opinions and beliefs about just about everything, regardless of their level of knowledge. Of these. One of the things that some people believe in is the supernatural, karma, dogma, ghosts, gods of all sorts. And of the god belief glitter arty, there's a specific subspecies that believe in the prosperity gospel. That their god affinity financially makes it rain on faithful followers. <laughs> it also comes from perhaps an unintended side belief that prosperity is the result of virtuous living, which, while it may explain uh, some support uh, that this belief uh, it puts faith in, say, a wealthy politician. Uh, it does not seem to be rooted in research of any kind. So research then of a specific kind was done. While prosperity beliefs can fuel values linked to entrepreneurial thinking, such as power and achievement, according to Baylor University, researchers found no direct relationship between prosperity beliefs and the willingness to take risks and little connection to recognizing opportunities, both of which are very uh, typical traits in successful entrepreneurs, according to their study. Uh, Quoty Voice, and this is Kevin Doherty, PhD Associate Professor of Sociology in Baylor's College of Arts and Sciences, as revealed in our findings, a belief that God will provide financial benefit to the faithful is not enough to push someone to launch a business. The relationship between prosperity beliefs and starting a business is indirect and inconsistent. For their study, researchers analyzed data from a nationally representative survey of 1,066 working adults. Their goal was to connect prosperity beliefs with human values, entrepreneurial attitudes, and most importantly, entrepreneurial action. How many of these people are actually going out and trying to do wealth generating things. Uh, participants responded to a three item scale to measure belief that faith and faithful behavior lead to success at work and in business. 
uh, these questions included, quote, God promises that those who live out their faith will receive financial success or believers who succeed in business are evidence of God's promised blessings or I believe faithful believers in God receive real financial benefits in this life. Participants also respond to questions relating to the theory of basic human values, where, which uh, recognizes such universal values as openness to change, achievement, security, power, and benevolence. In general, these entrepreneurs tend to think differently, or entrepreneurs in general think, tend to think differently than non-entrepreneurs. They prize achievement, self-direction. They downplay tradition and conformity, which is sort of in juxtaposed to a uh, theory that is rooted in tradition and conformity being prizing the achievement and self-direction of entrepreneurship. So there was already sort of an imbalance built into this. Uh, so while prosperity beliefs themselves show little direct impact on actual entrepreneurship, they do impact the values and attitudes related to creating a business. Prosperity beliefs can strengthen a relationship between self-enhancement values and opportunity recognition. Uh, but they seem to reduce the relationship between openness and change and willingness to take risks. So in short, the summary of this study seems to be that prosperity faith makes people think the pursuit of wealth is a noble, virtuous idea, but offers no tools with which to succeed in such pursuit better than praying for it to rain. Wow. Out business school for some, at least some lessons on money management and business organization, marketing, maybe? Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> Hard work? Hey. <laughs> nope, that's not to do it. None of it. Come on! That's the thing. Make it, yeah, it kind of does explain a lot of the, of the you know, you, you can look at how large ideologies or religions uh, sort of formulate people's thinking and people's outlook on the world. And it's yeah. it, to have a very pro wealth uh, business uh, mindset, but not really maybe connect it to the tools that, that, uh, that, that allow the success in that it's sort yeah. of a complicated situation that these there's another step are, that are needs to happen. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. You need to connect mm -hmm. the, you can end up in a prosperous faith. You can mm -hmm. space, believe that you're going to get there. But here's how you work hard to get to that place. There's that connecting yeah. those dots needs to happen. And it's not, it's not but to I say love... that these folks wouldn't be hardworking. Yeah. Uh, but the, but Knowing yeah. how, but the having the tools. That, the, the idea that the, the, the prosperity comes out of uh, a, fa a supernatural favor. Uh, that you are given uh, versus something that you would actually have to take a risk. I always, I always had an issue with the, uh, was it the, the, the power, what is it? Positive thinking or not just positive thinking, but the secret, uh, is that what you're thinking the, about? Yes. Well, the, the idea that, well, li that li for real. No, right? it's, it's that likes attract the, uh, the, mm -hmm. this concept of things that are the same attract and they started invoking physics and new age stuff to explain this concept of, of if you want something it'll come to you because likes attract and i'm like no no, no that's in, not how physics in, works in physics and chemistry opposites attract so you cannot say they're using scientific principles and yeah. how come not enough people know enough about science to know the basics there because yeah. well they don't believe it you want to believe yeah. something it's, instead anyway they're just picking just the wrong related side. to that is what, what i was thinking about with the secret and visualization right which is pretty similar to a lot of this faith-based stuff that you're talking about is just like you're 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 asking a higher power for something that's kind of just saying i really want this i'm gonna make it happen i really want this i'm gonna make it happen which is its own kind of interesting faith-based scenario as well yeah yeah not yep. enough. No, there's mm -hmm. more details. <laughs> more. Yeah. There's more details involved for sure. You know who have to focus on a lot of details? People who, who? make robots. 
people who make robots have to focus on all these details. Like, how do you get your robot to stand up? How do you get your robot to walk? Or in the case of researchers at University of California, Berkeley, how do you get them to bounce like a pogo stick? Uh Uh-oh. These engineers have created a tiny robot. It's not even a foot tall. It's called Salto. And Salto is this super cute, nimble robot that bounces. Pretty much all it does is bounce. But they have had to um, work with, they've uh, applied the mechanics of animal movement. And they have been trying to develop a robot that can navigate on uh, or Mm. using saltatorial locomotion. On I'm watching the video. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like this robot. Well, okay. It's for creeping me out. out. <laughs> Let's see if I can get the. Um, let me we'll just see while if I can get that. the robot, the robot video up for you all. Give me a second. While Wait. you're doing that, I have a question. Why? <sighs> Why? Yeah. Because... What's the? You know, like usually when they train robots to do something, there's some sort of. Um, practical application. Salto okay. is a little 100 gram Can't robot. Get it to turn it's down. only about Hold one on. foot long Hold altogether. On. Okay, I'm learning all the details. There. Yes, okay. he's a cute little robot. What do you want to know? What, uh, what's the practical application of this ability? He's the cute little bouncing robot. What more do you need, Blair? It's, Why I believe and- this robot may bounce up mountains like a mountain goat. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? But really, um, what they've been what uh, they've been able to do is uh, is create a self writing okay. system that is so aware gotcha. of its own place in space that it is able to not fall over. It uh, it has proprioception in a sense, so that it stays upright <gasps> as it's moving forward, as it's bouncing off of <gasps> objects that are at angles. It has incredible oh balance and agility, and the idea is maybe not necessarily that Salto will go on to do something useful, but what they have enabled Salto to do can be incorporated into other robotic designs. I've never seen it. It's got an eight to 10 mile an hour uh, speed limit and it can, has a vertical of four feet. Vertical jump of four feet. This is this serious. It's a little bunny rabbit. It's a little bunny rabbit robot. It's tiny and it's so, cute. And why don't you like it, Blair? No, I like it a lot. I'm just, <laughs> there's all this like weird, it's, it's not uncanny Valley, but it's like with the, with that, um, the, the dog robot that had the backwards knees in the back. What was his name again? I don't remember. The um, dog. there's just something which big, yes. Dog. Yeah. The, yeah, big dog. So it's just like with that, there's a little bit of something about it that's just, it's it's so cool that it's kind of scary to me. It's kind of, it. it's back to the like world robot domination thing, but also it's just kind of like, yeah. um, huh, they don't need us anymore. <laughs> this is scary. Yeah, but if they're um, cute, like it'll be so much easier for them to take over. So yeah, it's a foot but, long, but, but it has a four foot buddy. vertical. That's Which cool. means it's yeah. if if it was if it was a human, it would be able to jump like twenty plus feet. That's true. Um, and perhaps so. This is should we the go kind... on a field trip? I want to go see it. <laughs> <laughs> we should go to Berkeley and visit Salto. Yeah, but yeah. perhaps this kind of technology—it's super lightweight. But maybe this kind of technology could be incorporated into human mecha suits. I mean, maybe there is technology that will allow people wearing. Um, Techno- uh, wearing outfits to help have help them have strength in uh, in crossing terrain uh, that that it yeah. could allow people to jump and leap in in similar so, ways. So so That's another way cool. of saying this this is this is uh, the creation of a mech suit for uh, lack of a better mm-hmm. explanation. That's that's fully functional yeah. with just one leg. A <laughs> mech suit a pogo leg. stick. Pogo it's stick. It's a mech yeah. pogo stick. Yeah. It is just like a little boingy po- pogo stick. It boing, 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 boing. It's, it's adorable. It's almost it's, like a robotic flea, the way it's bouncing around, too. Yeah. It's I think that's awesome. part of it. There's something, there's something almost 
um, biologically familiar about the way it was bouncing around. The fact that it wasn't exactly up and down every time and it was kind of self-adjusting. I think that was what was making me a little bit itchy. Yeah. A little bit too natural. They've they've got got it down. Yeah. 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 It's a... It's a, I think it's a very neat design, and I think they've they've come up with something that is going to be fun on its own and potentially, you know, maybe useful on its own. But like I said, probably has a lot so more application shown, for other things. Part of the video was shown also included a segment where this little bouncing robot uh, had a somebody put a I think Justin, who uh, was the maybe the creator of this, was putting a a board underneath it, like a little little uh, square of of plywood and this is also we saw with big dog when they're kicking is you try to mess with uh the mm-hmm. robot you try to give it an unknown and un- unexpectable which you know, how much is the robot really pre cognizing anything you, know, you throw something else under it a surface that wasn't going to appear where it, where you might expect from where it takes off and lands and it could adjust to it uh that is that is an incredibly powerful feature uh that we just witnessed there is the ability to adapt yep. to a, a, a changing environment change yeah. in environment yeah absolutely and identity four in the chat room has pulled out a miyazaki reference and says that the robot reminds reminds him of turnip head from howl's moving castle so if any of you have seen howl's move howl's yeah. uh moving castle and uh have seen turnip head you may have a mental picture yeah okay what else do we have going on here have we come to that time in the show where it's time for quick stories mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. run through a few things pretty quickly all right well a new study that is just published in the journal of hazardous materials researchers have exposed natural and some engineered microbes to Plastics, and they found that these particular microbes were able to break down the chemical makeup of those plastics, polystyrene and polyethylene, causing polyethylene's weight to go down by 7% and polystyrene's weight to go down by 11%. So uh, these microbes work best after the materials are exposed to sunlight and a little harder. So uh, not just sunlight, but seawater which would happen in an ocean environment. So potentially these microbes could be used to combat plastic ocean pollution. So good as news. Long as, they, uh, as long as they can incorporate into the Neustrom. Uh. <laughs> yeah, right. As long as they can incorporate well, yes. Oh, and because scientists need to know these things, and I really didn't realize we didn't know this already, but researchers... Uh, presented some preliminary results at a research conference called Digestive Disease Week. And the researchers from University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston fed rats coffee for three days. And And different groups of rats got caffeinated or decaf. The researchers looked to see what was going on in the intestines of the rats. And they found that the bacterial populations, the concentrations were reduced. We still don't know whether these are good bacteria or bad bacteria being reduced, but concentrations of bacteria go down with coffee drinking in rats. Additionally, coffee stimulates gut motility. Uh, Coffee makes you poop. That's pretty (laughs) much it. Gut motility means. And they confirmed it. They confirmed it. Yeah, I feel like we've definitely known that for decades. <laughs> we've known it for a long time. Yes, that's uh, pretty cool. But they, they, uh, yeah. Anyway, this is what they found. They looked at the gut. They found that coffee made it more motile and changed the bacteria that are there. There's still some re- more research to go to see what's going on with those bacteria specifically, and whether it's a good or a bad effect. Hmm? Yes, Blair. Please don't give me bed bugs. Oh, I won't. Um, although I, I don't like all this slander because bed bugs 
are the uh, inventors of traumatic insemination. So let's give them those props real quick. Okay. Without all them, right. I wouldn't have that amazing story. So let's just, all right. But anyway, uh, bed bugs, they're a lot older than we thought. Um, previous estimates were that they were between 50 to 60 million years old. That's when bats first showed up in evolutionary time. They thought that, uh, scientists had previously thought that bats were the very first hosts of bed bugs, but new DNA analysis from dozens of bed bug, bug species tell us they are closer to a hundred million years old. So they are twice as old as we thought, about 50 million years earlier is when they showed up. And that was around the time of the dinosaurs. But before you ask, well yeah. most likely they did not feed on dinosaurs. The, the reasoning behind that is that that is because bed bugs and all their relatives require animals to have a home base, like a bird's nest or an owl's burrow in order for them to um, attach. So in most cases, it looks like dinosaurs didn't have something analogous to that. Although I feel like we might just not know about that because if they're super closely related to birds, the likelihood that they had some sort of nest, I would say is very high, but that is a whole separate um, tangent. Point being, current uh, no, no. estimates are now 100 million years old, uh, back in the time of dinosaurs. And uh, not just that, but their DNA analysis told us that they did not specialize on hosts. Over those hundred million years, these bed bugs were hopping around from host to host throughout evolutionary time. So previous evidence showed uh, us that the evolution of ancient humans caused a split in um, parasites, bed bugs in particular, into a new species. This new DNA, DNA analysis tells us most likely not so. So. so I would I would imagine it would be uh, early mammals that they were using because we were we were burrowing nesters, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and we that would make sense. all along the way, all along the way, mammals. A lot of us, uh, we like to be indoors. It's just a it's it's just a certain uh, a streak that's within this mammal clad that we we like to be in caves or in burrows or in houses a lot. Yeah. Well, and if you think about it, if you think about an animal that's going to drink blood and parasitize, is it going to be, are they going to parasitize off something that has a really fast met metabolism or a really slow metabolism? Is it going to be a warm blooded animal versus cold blooded? Is it going want to a be a deep sleeper? Um, yeah. Do you, or do <laughs> you want something someone that who doesn't eating have... every single day? You don't want someone who has a good itch a response. Sleeper. No. Do you want the higher oxygen concentration in blood? Those are the things that I would wonder, which I think mammals are going to have a lot of those things. Yeah. So, yep. Going and for more nutrients, more we'll oxygen. See. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Thanks for bringing us the history of bed bugs. Mm -hmm. Always. <laughs> They've been around forever and we're never going to get rid of them. Just letting everyone well, know. Yeah. Just check your mattresses. <laughs> But that brings fine. us, does this bring us to the end of the show? I, I think, think so. It does. We have done another show. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this episode. I'm glad that we were able to get it done. And I would love to say thank you to Identity4 for recording the episode. Thank you to Gord for making that chat room work. And thank you to Fada for helping out with social media and our show notes. Couldn't do it without you. I would also like to thank my co-hosts for being awesome co-hosts and rolling with the punches. Aww, that's so sweet. Thank you. And I'd like to thank our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Paul Disney, Richard Onimus, Ed Dyer, Andy Gross, Stu Pollock, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Harrison Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Craig Landon, Mark Mazaros, Jack, Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill K. Bob Calder, Time Jumper 319, Eric Knapp, Richard, Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, Corinne Benton, Adam LaJoy, Sarah Chavis, Rodney, Tiffany Boyd, John Bertram, Mountain Sloth, Seth O'Gradney, Stephen Al Alberan, 
John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Andrew Swanson, Paul Ronovich, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Ben Bignell, Richard Porter, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zuknarek, Ashish Pants, Ulysses Adkins, Artyom, Rick Ramis, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Sislewski, Jim Drapeau, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Ben Rothig, Steve Leesman, Kurt Larson, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie Gary S., Robert Greg Briggs, Ben and Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luthen, Matt Sutter, Mark Hessenflow, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, and EO. Thank you for supporting us on Patreon. And if any of you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, finding more information out about Patreon, you can click the Patreon link at twist.org. Also remember that you can tell other people about Twist and send them to twist.org for information. On next week's show, we will be back again. We have an interview scheduled with a sex chromosomologist. <gasps> she is a, a, a genetic a geneticist who works with sex chromosomes. And we might talk about the platypus. And I'm very excited about this. Oh. Yes, I'm very thrilled. So hopefully we'll get that together for next week's show. Live, 8 p.m. Pacific time. And we will let you know where to find us. Don't worry if you can't make it. You will always be able to find past episodes at twist.org. Yes, thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science and your iTunes directory. Or if you have the mobile type devices, we are This Week in Science in anything Apple Marketplace. -y. For more information on anything you've heard here today, I'll tell you where you can go. It's to www.twist.org. <laughs> when you're there, you'll find show notes. You'll find places to make comments. And you'll be able to start some conversations with hosts and other listeners. Yeah, but if you're one of those type of people who doesn't like to talk to strangers, uh, you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in your subject line. Otherwise, your email might just get spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter, where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you tonight, a rock opera you would like to totally rewrite in awesome form please let us know we'll be back here maybe here maybe youtube here somewhere here on the internet next week and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news yes and if you've learned anything from this show uh, remember it's all in your head <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from Japan And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method 
instead of rolling a die. We may rid the world of toxoplasma. God the eye. It's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science This week in science this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science. I found the wipes. Let's have a cube zoom. Pew! 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 <laughs> Out of control. Out of control. Kiki, you're out of control. Ooh. Take those wipes away. <laughs> I know. I'm finally getting to play with my software. You're right, Goldizator. Um, so we went, I can only really use the lower thirds because I don't have lower thirds that will, I don't, they're not going to go in right if I hit that. See, it's just all Blair. Oh, Blair. This is how we're going. Yeah, see, it's all Blair. Oh, yeah. And so I need to get, um, if we're going to sit in the three, we need lower thirds that'll sit under each of our names. Oh, yeah, that'll so have need, all three in there. Yeah. And it'll have all three in there, and that would be great. Thank you for, uh, yeah, thanks, Ed. I I had issues with my my operating. I don't have a ton of practice in this, and I don't have... I should get just a keypad where I can just get everything arranged. So I just hit a button and it just does. And it just does what I want it to do, right? You have it all pre programmed. <sighs> I'm glad the theme sounds better on your new headphones, Fada. That's good. Yes. But I've, yes, this software works wonderfully and the Twitch stream is so nice. But the thing is, if the, the thing, one of the things that has kept me from doing this as the setup is that if Blair's talking, and I just put Blair up there, bump, well, there's Blair, I can, I can give her her lower third. I can lower third you and all that. But Ooh, on, the other end, on the other end of the line, she's just staring at herself. She's not. Staring. The way this That's system true. works is it doesn't send, if we're having a conversation, yeah. she can't see me because it only sends the output, the, uh, the video out output to her. And so she can't see me and she's just talking into the screen by herself. I mean, you can get used to that. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to but, tell when somebody else wants to talk is the only problem. Yes. Yeah. And you end up talking um, over each other more. But the other thing is... I would have to figure out uh, how to add another person. Oh, I need. Yeah. I would need a. I would need a, a different setup for a four box or something like right. that. I'd have to find something. Yeah. The other problem is that this was the best it's ever been, but there still is sometimes a little bit of a delay. delay. 
Yeah. And so I feel like we end up talking over each other a little more. Yeah. But yeah, it wasn't quite as smooth as usual conversations. But I also think, I mean, yeah, identity saying it's more stable on the viewer's end. I mean, I think people, the mm. audio and the video is better on Twitch mm -hmm. than on mm -hmm. YouTube. Don't know. Gem Doctor's saying Twitch has subs and bits and it enables viewers to gift money to streamers. Well, Zader's looking at the stats. The late of viewers is 6.86 seconds. They're a little bit behind us. Not, not significantly, though. Mm -mm. Not significantly. Where did Justin go? Did he leave the call? Mm -mm. I think his He's... camera's just off. Mm. Oh, World Robot Domination T. Those are good. Well, does Ader years Justin's will do what Justin's will do, you know? Just... Justin's, Justin's will do what Justin's will do. Yeah. <sighs> the Pogo, the Pogo robots really was really wonderful. Um, it won't be over. <laughs> it's so cute. Um, so people earlier in the chat room were having a big conversation about copyright and why couldn't I just play Emma singing the song or whatever. I mean, technically, I probably could have sung the lyrics, but I didn't practice ahead of time. <laughs> and so it probably, it wasn't going to be exact. It wasn't going to be right. Um, but, you know, it's parody. And as Fada brought up, it is parody. And there's a certain amount of fair use accepted with parody uh, for music. But when you're thinking about music, there is the, there are the song lyrics and there's also the music. Both of them have separate copyrights. And so what uh, Emma had done when she sent me her audio file is used an original uh, instrumental music track, not a parody, not something she made up using guitar. It was an original instrumental track. And so okay. while the lyrics may not have gotten tagged by any algorithmic, uh, you know, system that YouTube or Twitch or anyone else has in place, the music would have. Certainly, okay. but so, so and so, here's, but here's, and here's... and hold on. Let me finish what I was going to say. Let me just tie it up. And so, really, when you're in in dealing with anybody else's content or a parody or any of these things on something like YouTube or these big roboticized uh, platforms, they're gonna they're gonna mute you and ban you before you have a chance to explain yourself. And I'm mm -hmm. not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. And you know, so, also it so and also it is my, copyright music, and I didn't. We didn't ask permission, and so we're not no. going to do. We're so not playing can it. I, can yes, I? Yes, now um, I'm done. I'm done. I just wanted to finish. Can I? Inter I just want would like to interject. I was saying you, but can. now I can't because you finished. I was trying to interject, but now you finished. So there's no point in me interjecting. Oh, now you can add. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so here's here's the question that uh, formulates immediately after this, because I, I think this is a fair use category because it is, and I, you, you, you laid it out uh, succinctly why the elements of which may not be. Okay. As a standalone, would it be something that by itself would get banned or would our entire channel and everything we've ever put on the internet be banned forever if we put this up as a standalone? Because, no, it would, it would only be, do the okay. episode. It would be the episode. But what would happen okay. is this, no, like no. this whole episode no. that we just did. Yeah, I, I hear nobody what would you're see saying. it. <laughs> I know, and I'm, I'm following this, uh, completely, uh, and specifically. Uh, what I'm saying is, if we just put the song out as a standalone, separate piece, uh, and let it live as long as it can in the in an un un unfriendly uh world of interwebs uh would that be something we could entertain we could probably put it on our patreon channel because that yes. we could we could uh, not make yeah. it public but make it uh okay. make it private to right to patrons 
because then it's okay. private and it's not a, you know, out to the internet kind of thing. Um, so we could probably post it to our Patreon channel okay. that way. So yes. that's a good half measure to what I was saying. Mm -hmm. uh, we could potentially, further... trying to think also if we could just put it on the podcast because that's not YouTube, but still it's copyright music okay. and I'm, I'm not, I I'm still, it's not mine. I'm still... <laughs> I'm still going to go one more thing that I'm reiterating further and say we could do the Patreon thing. They'll get it. We could try the podcast. It'll probably be fine. However, is it possible that we could do a standalone YouTube piece of this and and allow it to be tested by the algorithms of the YouTube space? And the, and the reason uh, the reason I think is that it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting challenge to the algorithm, perhaps. But it's also if it doesn't ban everything that Twist has done over fifteen years and thousands of hours of programming, yeah, and, and it would only affect that one one yeah. episodic piece, which is just that uh, just that that song. I think it's worth at least trying that to open it to a wider audience. But it's still, Emma's thing still uses copyrighted music, not ours. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, what's copyright to mean anyway? It's copyright. The, it's lyrics, all... the lyrics on their own are hers, and she's done a, yeah, and that's a parody. And that, that's absolutely well, didn't okay. We, didn't we play something on our show that got that show pulled that like, wasn't even that famous. It was like a is somebody that sent something into us and we played it and YouTube still found which means if we play something by Queen, yeah. it's yeah. definitely gonna get pulled right away. Yeah. Let's see. No. That's what I'm saying. That seems like a lot of work for something you know is gonna fail immediately. Okay. <laughs> well that that and that right there is the story <laughs> of my life. That statement, that's gonna that's on the tombstone. Yeah. <laughs> what I had fail. with Let's something you knew was going to fail no matter what. It's gonna end badly no matter what I do. So you know what? I have all freedom to do what I want to do. Okay. Uh um, post it. I'm gonna post it to Patreon, you guys. Maybe okay. that's what I, it's gonna be private. Yeah, post it to Patreon. And, yeah. and, and, Patreon. I think that's the thing to do. And yeah, and uh, I would like a copy of this. I would like to rock this in my car. I will cool send you. Um, I will make sure scary. you get a copy of it. Yes. I got to say good night again. Okay. And, um, Wait, are you? Do you have? Are you doing late night stand up again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Are you? Are you? Doing, <laughs> you are. <laughs> It's no, no, no. This I'm like, is it's 10 o'clock. It's like 10 o'clock. You're going a, out. A, what are you doing? It's, it's a spoken word poetry, um, non amateur oh. open mic night that I have signed up for. Oh. So it's not a comedy thing. You're going to go the, read uh, disclaimers, aren't you? No. I'm going to have a <laughs> disclaimer, <laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer, you know? Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. <laughs> Uh, and then I, then I can't say the rest of it because it's uh, not safe for prime time. Uh, Ooh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. That sounds like a fun evening. You did it last. Did you do this last week also? Uh, no, 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 no. I, this is all lies right now, by the way. This is, I'm just saying things in words. It, I'm sorry. Uh, but I do have to go <laughs> all the same. Um, <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> uh, What's he doing? We'll never know. We'll which means never. listeners, make up what you wish Justin was doing right now. <laughs> and as long as we he's like the Schrodinger's <laughs> Justin. Do you think he's it's walking aimlessly yeah. along the streets yeah. in Davis at night singing yes, Bohemian Rhapsody at the top of his lungs? He could be. There's no that, evidence to the contrary. It's not that it's not. He, he it's chooses that to and. think that he's doing stand-up comedy. No evidence to the contrary. Jeez. Jeez. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I choose goodness. to think that he's doing some late night shopping at some store that's open, like a Goodwill, just like 
open late, like, you know. Yeah, yeah it's, it's Black going Friday. Out there. It's, it's only the best for two hours and it's right after the show. It is. <laughs> and it's all lab yeah. equipment. Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. yeah. There's no way to know the you know, somebody else could think he has his own um garage crisper no, no, no. set up, you know, no. working on I'm that. just I just need to get in there early so I can get the uh pipette cozy. He could fun. be he could be knitting some some covers for his new skis he just bought. Who knows? Oh yeah, me on the ice. No, not happening. Yeah. No. no, this is not <sighs> this is not an ice uh, ice traveling man. No, uh, uh-uh. uh, skis. Maybe uh, he's stockpiling no. uh, some aerosol uh, hair products. <laughs> Who knows? With this, yeah, no, this is not hair product. It's never touched this just, hair. The, uh, that curl, it's just uh, you gotta get it somehow. Yeah, it's it's Aquanet. Superman, Superman hair products. Okay, I will admit it's a ladybug farm, and the best time to <laughs> work on your ladybug farm is late at night when the ladybugs are all asleep. That's how that works. Yeah, ladybugs. I don't oh, yeah. believe you. You no, it's not, not ladybugs. Me. It's it's you blast ended scroots for sure. <sighs> he's got some blast ended scroots in his garage. He's saying, I have no idea what that means, but I love the idea of it. Why is that not working? All right. Well, you go have fun. Uh, yes. Go have a good time. I, I'm going to try and figure out. I, I made a twist. I thought I made a twist discord and I don't know what I did with it. So I'm going to see if I can find it again so I can give people. A twist discord? I don't know what you're talking about. Discord. It's a, it's a thing that people do. I don't understand it. I don't know. I don't know. It's this thing that people do know. and they like it. No There's kids these room. days for talking these to days. each other online back and stuff. Day, back in my day, we we, we didn't have Tinder. <laughs> if you, if you, <laughs> uh, you just you just went oh somewhere and you met somebody and that's who you ended up with. No mm-hmm. choice. I had a great conversation with my intern today about how when I was the Zoomobile intern, um, GPS wasn't a thing. And uh, I had to print out MapQuest maps because Google Maps oh, yeah, didn't yeah, exist wait. yet. I love that. I love how you're like, it, I or, or, so you would try day. that. Hold on. Hold on. So that was like, I had MapQuest was like paper brand new. That was already printed. Yeah. So MapQuest was brand new. So not all of the addresses were accessible. So you, so I did use paper maps as well. Um, or I would just write down step-by-step directions that were in a file from the 1970s on how to get to this particular school. Um, but yeah, it's pretty good. Okay. Pretty, pretty uh, good stuff. Say good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. Say good night, Justin. Night. <laughs> Ooh, now I need a freeze frame. A, that's a freeze frame. Freeze frame. <laughs> we'll just we'll just pretend he's still here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, With his ring finger down. That's funny. I know. I gotta I gotta figure out how to get in because. I'm going to this here and it says that's your password. And it says, Did you forget your password? And I'm like, No, I didn't save that. What? Why isn't it logging in? Wants to use that as the password. Why won't that work? Okay. What's my password? Hey, do you guys want to see my art? I want to see your art. I'm going to figure out. What I did with Discord a while ago. You show your art. I still have to paint. So this is just the beginning. This is stage one. Here's the first one. Nothing secured yet. So there's stage one. I'm trying to, it's hard to, there we go. Um, so there we go. There's that. Okay. And then, so I'm going to oil paint on the background. So here's the second one I did. 
So you see this. So it's supposed to be like stained glass. So I'm going to paint behind. I'm going to paint, use oil painting back here and then lay this on top and it'll look like stained glass. And then I did, so I also, I have to do these backwards. So for this one, oh, cool. I had the really tough challenge of doing all these letters and numbers backwards. It's hard. It's hard. It's very okay. hard. Okay. There we go. Okay, you guys, Paint. Discord app, I put, there's a thing, I can invite you. There, but how do I make so it? So I'm going to paint them and then glue the paper on top. And then it will be fake stained glass. It is a cutout that is freehand with a razor blade and black cardstock. Sit. I think it's cool. I I like the way it looks. I can't wait. I'm excited. See. I'm like I'm excited and scared to paint the first one because that's always when it gets real, you know. Yeah. And it's like uh, you don't know if you're gonna ruin it. <laughs> the good news is nothing's secured, so I can paint the background, wait for it to dry, lay this on top if I don't like it. I can make adjustments so um i can fuss with it as you long can as I want mess around I... with it and not be like yeah. i just ruined my cutout yeah that's important okay i'm yeah. putting got if you everybody who was mm, there's the link to this week in science discord made it i had to move it between different computers <laughs> i made it um you could join Discord, Blair. What is? So if we ever wanted to record a podcast or whatever, but it's a chat, it's a chat app uh, that you can make groups. And within the groups, you can, you can also record audio. They don't do video. Um, but hey, people just got on in here into the Discord server. There you go. We're Discording. Who is this? Yeah, you're going to find it. You'll figure it out. We exist. Oh, I have to make an account. <laughs> <laughs> oh. More account. No, you, you just made a Justin face. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Joining the Discord server. I don't know what to do here. Uh, I put a room in here. We have a general channel. And I made a channel for what has science done for you lately. There is also a channel for interview recommendations. Um, what's voice channels? I don't know what that is. Oh, so we can talk. Actually talk. That's a different computer. My audio is all that's not gonna work. I can add a different server if I want to, and be in somebody else's Discord. I have a Discord for daily. I, I see the D Discord for DTNS, Geeks Life. You know, life changes when you find your login information. You're oh, welcome, everyone. You can exist in the Discord if you Discord for other places. Oh, how do I change mm. my stuff? I don't know. I don't know anything. Like, how do I change my, <laughs> my like, stuff? <sighs> Who you are? Oh, is this like a... This is vaguely reminding me of um, AIM a little bit. It is kind of like AIM, yeah. Especially since it's like, do bit. not disturb, invisible, idle. It's yeah. very interesting. Kind of old school that way. Bringing it back. Want. Someday I'll put a little icon for my picture. I haven't figured out how to do any of these things yet. I'm just like, what? Yeah, I'm, here? <laughs> look at all these people. I'm trying to do that right now. 
Oh, I need to password the voice chat or anybody, but I had, but they can join it, but I don't have to make it actually audible, right? Does it actually go audible? I haven't create, oh, I haven't create, edit the, edit the voice chat channel. Overview, general. Oh, I guess. I guess I could do that. Oh, at everyone. Okay. Does it matter? Do, do you want people to be able to just talk, right? Available to whoever has joined. And they can talk to each other with voice. Wait. Hot, why is Hot Rod telling you to ask me about the calendar? Oh, um, he sent me a really interesting email. Um, I'll forward it to you, but it basically, he, he thinks he can make the calendar a desktop program so that people who don't want paper calendars can pay for a download to make it a virtual calendar on their computer. Oh, to make it a download, which is pretty neat. That could be cool. Yeah. So. I'll send you the email he sent me, but yeah, send me the email and we'll we'll talk about we'll talk about that. Yeah. An optional download, not yeah. So you can either get it in paper or have it oh, downloadable, yeah, but you that still pay for go. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hey, I changed my avatar. How come it didn't do that? Hmm. Hey, who has member permissions? Oh. Create, I just turned off create instant invite. That's what I'm doing. Is that what I want to do? Have unsaved changes. Save. I'm just hitting buttons. What? No. No, it makes a funny sound. Bloop, bloop. Bad. Ah. Escape, escape. Too much going on. Too much going on. Too many things. Um, I had a... um. I had a, a conference call and we got kicked from our Zoom meeting. And so we started up on Google Hangouts and I was at work. And so there's a bunch of stuff in the Google suite I have to do for work. But mm -hmm. I, I, so I have to use like my personal Gmail account because my work account can't access the Google suite and all this stuff. And so um, I log in and everybody I was on the call with went, oh, there's a frog. That's definitely Blair. <laughs> Blair the Frog. Yeah. I was like, got me. <laughs> it was great. Everyone knew right away. Blair the Frog. Blair the Frog. Nice. Okay. Um, great. I don't have a picture for my picture. I change the um, oh there we go change avatar that's what I need to do. How do we get an so avatar? if I am like low key looking at laptop options, yes, specifically for traveling to live gigs, oh. what are the things that I always need to be able to do mm. at live gigs? Play music, mm -hmm. surf the internet. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, I mean, you definitely, the new so Macs project, are, I guess. project possibly, yeah. So like the new Macs and even some of the new thin PCs, they don't have any connectors. They've all got, um, what is it, USB-C? The Macs have lightning yeah, ports. Or, um, yeah, yeah. And I've heard that, 
I don't remember. I've heard they've started to do switch lightning, uh, switch USB C's to lightning ports on a lot of different computers. I think that's the way they're going. And, um, okay. and as a result, um, yeah, as a result of all the, all the changes that the mic in, um, you can, you can get a computer with, you know, then you just have to buy dongles that allow you to connect all the things. Mm -hmm. but if you can, mm -hmm. if you don't mind a fat computer <laughs> having all the ports and having like an ethernet port where you can plug in and be connected to the internet. Otherwise you're going to end up with having to rely on the, the, the USB-C yeah. or the lightning port and the dongles. And yeah. some of those don't yeah. work and they're all, they can be like, and some of them that work really well, can, they're like an additional couple hundred dollars for a good hub. Yeah. I yeah. Especially the ethernet port. I need that. Yeah. So yeah. I'm either going to have to go with a Mac that's a couple years old or jump ship and go PC, which I don't want to do. Right. Is anyone in the uh, chat or the Discord now? Because it seems as though a lot of people just like jumped ship and are now playing in Discord. <laughs> yeah. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts on what Blair should what Blair should do? I like. I mean, Macs yeah. are just great and they work. They usually just are easy to use and. Yeah, the real yeah. plug and plays. I love them so much. Mm -hmm. Um, I just mostly feel like this computer, so it's a 2011, I, every time I get on a plane with it, I'm like, am I going to like bang into something just right? And this computer is going to die because it's so old, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Are we doing that? You're like, please let it make one more week, one yeah. more, one more Which, trip. Then I'm like, oh, should I get something that's light and a little more um, versatile and travel friendly for the live shows so that I'm not lugging like the the power max, the really good power max are really heavy, which is frustrating. I don't know. No. I, don't hey, know. I saved my I found a new app. Identity 4's Mac laptop has been going strong since 2010. Yeah, mine is mine is mm -hmm. going, but it's it's definitely it's hot, getting hot harder says, for it. Yeah, Hot Rod says go PC, more stuff is available. But then there's the whole issue of syncing my um, Apple accessories yeah. with the computer, which is way harder to do on a PC. Yeah. Yeah, if doesn't that's do how you like to play. The same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I don't know. <sighs> I'll keep. I'll keep what did Blair do to her avatar? No, wait. What? No. Fancy. Who's fancy. Mm -hmm. Ford said you look fancy. Did you change? Oh yeah, I uh, I changed my avatar. But I don't see it changed yeah. anymore. Where'd it go? If you look. To oh, the right, there you are. That is fancy. It's the Nautiloid. Make that avatar. Ooh, I'll give you. I can give you a role. What role should she have? <laughs> I don't know what role. Well, it looks like are. you're the. You're, You're the king, in charge. So. I'm going to say in charge. Oh, make make me the hand of the king, will you? <laughs> I, I would be to... honored to be your hand. <laughs> Tin soldier says the cook. <laughs> All right. <laughs> how do I make that go away? I got to figure out how to do that. Ooh, member list. That, oh, no, that was just putting. Yeah, I'm just going to read that as camber made and let it go. <laughs> <laughs> I 
believe Thanks it's for there. that suggestion. All you need to do, just look at Justin's face right now for Blair's response. <laughs> yeah. 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 Camber made sounds pretty tight. Camber so I'll made. stick with that one. Oh, goodness. Yeah. We should look we should look into other mm, look into computers. Good computers for you. I mean, if you mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. just stick with Mac if you want to, it's just easier and just figure out if you can get yeah. a newish Mac that doesn't force you into all the things. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah, and maybe just maybe look at the twist budget. Let me know if you can just give me a small subsidy. That would be great. <laughs> just a teeny yeah. tiny one. Tiny subsidy to help it go. Just like, you know, 15%. <sighs> corner keeper. Yes, I could make you a corner keeper. That's what Cord says. A Mac Mini. I don't even know what that. Oh, is that the, the tabletop one? Yeah. That's like yeah, a yeah. little, yeah, I need yeah. a laptop. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the, that's what I was like, oh, should I get a tabletop and then should I get like a Chromebook and use that for the live shows? And no, I need to, <laughs> I need to be able to project. I need an okay. ethernet port. I need all the USB ports. I'm really sad that this this computer was the next to last generation that had a CD drive. <laughs> yes, there's no such thing as CD drives anymore. <laughs> no. I used to um, at the last two places I lived. Actually, I didn't have a TV in my room, and I would rent. Okay, here's a fun glimpse into my life. <laughs> I would rent <laughs> an abacus. I would, go to the, I would go to the library and I would browse the DVDs and I would rent about 10 DVDs, just a whole bunch of like terrible comedies I never would have paid money to watch and like chick flicks and action films and, you know, like kids films that I was reminiscing on from my childhood and all this. I just get like 10 films. And then over the course of the next few weeks, it, whenever I had like a Friday night off and I was home by myself or whatever, I would pop a DVD into my laptop and watch it on a little like a uh, lap desk in bed. That was my like trashy movie wine in bed nights. So I like it. That was, yeah. We all, we all need trashy movies in bed with wine yeah. nights. Those are important nights. Especially especially when you're single and you live with a bunch of roommates. That was like perfect. Like, all right, I'm going to my room for the night. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was one of my fun, my fun like uh, ritual things that I would do. But yeah, new laptop, no DVD drive. Those, those nights would no longer exist. They wouldn't. But now it's Netflix. Have your laptop, internet, yeah. Netflix. Chill. Yeah, I guess. They don't have the same stuff. Netflix is getting better, but there, I still feel like there's a lot of mainstream films they don't get, especially new releases. Yeah. But, you know, listen to me complaining in the information <laughs> era. How dare I? Yeah, I don't have geez. to set up my 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 VHS my like uh, uh, machine to to record while I'm out of the house. So it's definitely better. I think this is better. Server settings. Ooh, maybe that's what I need. Server. Ooh, where am I? Roles. That's what I gotta get into. Oh, I see this place. The roles, I don't understand. Gord wants to know if this Discord link will be uh, permanent or if it's going to expire. It is a permanent link. The uh, link that I put in the IRC, the uh, free node, 
webchat.freenode. Uh, chat is a permanent link. It will not expire. Figured that out myself. Nice. Yeah, refurb from Apple. That's a, always good too. In the App Store. Oh, what is cool. it? D I S C H O R D, right? D what? No, D I S C O R D A P P. Discord app dot com. Hmm. It's for gamers, though. I'm not a gamer. You don't have to be a gamer to use it. <laughs> it was started by gamers, but it actually okay. is a. Um, it has come come across. Um, I don't know if you're not doing a video call, but just you know, want to make a channel that you can have group calls on. You give everyone voice access, and everyone gets to talk. You can have meetings on Discord, or you can have, and you can record them also, so you could. I don't know. Invite people into a room online and record them talking. Huh. Well, I just got the t the Discord app for my phone. There you go. I still haven't done that. Then I don't have a Mac, a an iPhone. I just have the phone that has to be moved three inches to the left and not have a buzz. Yeah. That was interesting. Uh need to move you over here. Yeah, hot rod. It's not a good replacement for video chatting, but it's nice for if you're doing an audio call. And for podcasting, I had used uh an, an online browser based voice system called Zencaster. And it just started mucking up all over the place and causing all sorts of trouble. And so I was looking for a good just voice replacement and Discord may be it. Hello, Rich Fielding or Rich Hello. <laughs> We are here online. Okay. You getting it? Got it? You get it? I got it. It's on my phone. Which means I'll be connected to the Twist Minions wherever I go. Yeah, you can talk to them wherever, whenever. Which is pretty That's cool. kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, what's up? I was trying to figure out. I, I think I accidentally paid for this app. I didn't know it wasn't free. But like, it's one of the things Apple does that's, that frustrates me is it, it added, I just, like, at some point allowed for it to add Touch ID for purchasing apps. Oh, no. And so it doesn't ask you, like, are you okay buying this app? And it just buys them. And then you're like, oh, another two ninety nine down the drain. Yeah, that's for Four sure. Four ninety nine. Frustrating. All these, all these little boop boop, beep boop, boop boop, beep boop. Mm. Like, how do I find out what I just for? bought? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oh, yeah. If we're ever in Minneapolis, we're happy to do a meetup. Go oh, show. <laughs> yeah, Hot Rod says Discord is just free to everyone else, Blair. That makes me mad. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've had conversations with people, though, who do think that Discord will start charging for certain services and certain aspects of what it does. So I'm not surprised that there is a billing in there somewhere oh there we go yeah by discord nitro for advanced features yeah for what we're doing i don't think we're ever going to be on the billing front of things but they're going to start wanting to make money off of what they've created at some point so that makes sense 
Oh, Adafruit has moved from Google Plus to Discord. A lot of forum activity. Yeah. Don't buy Nitro. Maybe maybe Blair bought Nitro. No, that can't be right. <laughs> oh, it says free in the App Store. Okay, yeah. I'm fine. You just thought you Press paid. Her. Word. <laughs> yeah, it said like uh, verifying Longer purchase. I think is price. what it said, and I was like, huh. Okay, what do you say? Should we call it a night? Yes, let's call it a night. Am I missing anything? I will send you the details for the. I've just been waiting to get an actual confirmation from the researcher that we're going to interview mm -hmm. next Wednesday to make sure, like, she said yes, but I haven't gotten the real confirmation. It was like, yeah, I think mm -hmm. that date could work. I'm like, right. Yeah. But does it? <laughs> yeah. Are but we going to do this? Yeah. Does it or doesn't it? Yeah. So I'm hoping that she'll get back to me and I can really confirm it for next week. Great. And you can get the Great. newsletter. I'm hoping I'll be able to say, send the newsletter tomorrow. We'll get it out. Great. Um, and then yeah. I can remove our bios and put um, a welcome note from you if you want to whip something up. Okay. Okay. I can do that. You could that write a little great. something and I could write a little something, a little welcome mm -hmm. note, and then I can send you a preview once we have that, and then it can yep. go. Okay, I can do that tomorrow. For sure. Great. Great. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. <laughs> Everyone's got all sorts of questions about dis Discord. Ed's like, what's this redeeming a Discord key? What is that doing? You can get into, it opens the doors to the castle, Ed. <laughs> it's magic. Okay. Yeah, it's time for bed now. It's ten thirty. Yeah. We did a show. We've had a great conversation. We, we started our Discord server, which is very exciting. Yes. Um. Yeah. Come up with all sorts of great things. Justin's missing out. Although I can't imagine that he would have jumped a chance to join the Discord server. Although, what do I know? No. Alrighty. Good night, Blair. See you next week. Hopefully Google Hangouts works so we can have a guest. I really hope that will work out so that we can have a guest. Otherwise, uh, maybe I'll just have to figure out how to make it work. Yeah. For this magic sauce. Right. We'll make it happen. Um, yeah. Oh, don't turn off my computer, Stella. Always touches the power button, Blair. Oh, Bella my takes God. Her it knows. She jumps up. She jumps up and she's like, my pa, right here on the power button. That would have shut shut us down immediately. Oh, boy. Would have been Knock abrupt. At. Good. Okay. Good night, everyone. Alrighty. Good night, Blair. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for another show. Thanks for jumping over on Twitch when we were unable to get to YouTube. Thanks to those of you who were able to run down the chat room and figure out where we were and what was going on. Thanks to those of you who were over on Twitch and started watching us. We do appreciate it. We'll see you okay. next week. I will be also doing my Dr. Kiki Twist Twitch stream on Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific time on Dr. Kiki. Twitch.tv slash Dr. Kiki. But we'll be back. We'll be back next Wednesday. We're doing all the things. Take care. Happy science. -ing.